Okay, so in the last video, we talked about some different ways of me measuring the amount of energy that can be stored in an energy source. And so we talked about the idea of specific energy and the energy or uh, the, the concept of energy density. Um, and so remember, specific energy is the amount of energy that can be um, released per kilogram of fuel, whereas energy density is the amount of energy that can be released per cubic meter of fuel. And so one is, you know, per unit mass and one is per unit volume. Okay, and so that's kind of where we left off um, in the last unit. And these equations, by the way, are not given um, in the data booklet. You're expected to know the definition of specific energy and ener energy density, and therefore be able to do basic calculations with them. Okay, now the calculations that you might see um, related to these two concepts um, are what I like to think of as really just fancy unit conversion problems. Okay, unfortunately, what that means is there's not really any equations, as we go through through a few examples, there's not really any equations that I can point to that, you know, you should always use this equation uh, to do an energy density problem or a specific energy problem. Um, it really just comes to, down to understanding units and understanding unit conversions um, and the concepts involved. And so hopefully, after we do some examples, you'll see what I mean by that. Okay, so... Let's do some uh, calculation examples with this concept of specific energy and energy density. All right, so we have this question here, and the question says coal has a specific energy of 32.5 megajoules per kilogram. Now, keeping in mind what that means is if I took one kilogram of coal and I burned it, it would release 32.5 megajoules of energy. Now, the question says if a city has a coal-fired power plant that needs to produce 30 megawatts of power with an efficiency of 25%, how many kilograms of coal are needed daily? Okay, so again, these questions that we're about to, to see don't necessarily have like specific set ways to solve them or to approach them, um, but you just kind of have to think like conceptually and in terms of um, unit conversion. So let me give you an example. Okay, so basically what we have here is we have a city needs 30 megawatts of power to run their lights okay now that doesn't mean that the power plant has to produce 30 megawatts of power because the power plant is only 25 percent efficient and so what that means is the power plant has to burn enough coal to produce more than 30 megawatts so that the town the city that's being powered is able to get the output of 30 megawatts taking into account the 25 percent efficiency okay so in other words what i mean is we know efficiency is output over input and so we know that the efficiency efficiency here is 25 percent so that would be 0.25 and we need an output to the city of 30 megawatts okay and so if you do some basic math you'll see that pn has to be 30 divided by 0.25, which is 120 megawatts. So in other words, the power plant has to burn enough coal every second to supply um, 120 megawatts so that after you take into account the efficiency, the city gets the 30 megawatts it needs of power. All right, so the question says, how many kilograms of coal are needed daily? Okay, now before we get to daily, I just want to remind you, when we say megawatt, uh, one watt, watt is the unit of power, and so one watt is one joule per second. <clears throat> and so when we say PN needs to be 120 megawatts, what that means is that um, every one second, we have to burn enough coal to produce 120 megajoules of energy. Okay, and so really, um, to answer the question being asked, how many kilograms of coal are needed daily, it might be a better idea to start off finding how many kilograms of coal do we need to burn every second in order to um, you know provide this power and then we can always find you know multiply by um, you know whatever conversion factors to find how many kilograms that is per day so we have 120 megajoules per second that we need to get from our coal and again, these problems don't have an equation associated with them necessarily, um, but you kind of have to approach them like holistically and conceptually and thinking. I always like to think of them as unit conversion problems. Okay, We have 120 megajoules per second, and basically what we really want to find here is we want kilograms 
per second. Okay, I know it says you know kilograms needed daily, but we can convert kilograms per second into kilograms per day really easily. Okay, so let's start with the kilograms per second part. All right, so we know that if I have megajoules on top, I have to have megajoules on bottom to cancel out. All right, oops, that should be an uppercase M. Lowercase M is milli. But I have a conversion factor that might help me out here because I know coal has a specific energy of 32.5 megajoules per kilogram. So that means for every 32.5 megajoules um, of energy I need, that would cost me one kilogram of coal. And so look at what I have here. Megajoules cancels out, and what I'm left with is kilograms per second. And if I want to, I can go one step further because really what I want is you know, kilograms per day, I can say, okay, there's 3,600 seconds in one hour, and, um, you know, there's 24 hours in one day. Okay, and everything cancels except kilograms in days, and so all I have to do is multiply across the top and bottom and divide. So 120 times 3,600 times 24, Divided by 32.5, and we get 319015 kilograms per day. Okay, now somebody's going to ask, like, why didn't you convert megajoules uh, to joules? Well, because I didn't need to do, do that in that in this problem, because I was I already had the power in megawatts, and the specific energy was already in megajoules. So I just kind of stayed with everything in mega. And so I, I didn't have to convert back to the base unit. There was no need to do that. Okay, so here's the answer to the question. Okay, so this uh, coal power plant has to burn over 300,000 kilograms every day just to provide enough power to run the city. Okay, and that's just one city in one state in one part of the country, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Okay, now I also want to point out again this question that we just looked at. I, I wasn't going based off of like a specific equation. I didn't have a specific approach necessarily, but I just kind of had to think through the problem, understand what the problem was asking, and then um, kind of think in terms of units, what do I need uh, to get what I'm looking for? Okay, and so these problems are not necessarily difficult, but they do require some critical thinking skills. All right, so pause there if you need to look at that some more. Let's take a look at another example. All right, so let's see. Um, so we've already talked about efficiency. Um, so example 1.5 says a natural gas power station has an output of 600 megawatts and an efficiency of 50%. The mass of natural gases burned per second is 20 kilograms. What is the specific energy of natural gas? Okay, so I want you to pause it here. I want you to try to do example 1.5 on your own, keeping in mind what is specific energy, what should the units of specific energy look like, and trying to work from what you're given back to that. Okay, so pause it here and try to do example 1.5 on your own. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out what this question is asking us to find. So the, it says the natural gas power station has an output of 600 megawatts and an efficiency of 50%. Now, I know efficiency is output over input. Okay, and so I know that basically what this means is that Pn, in this case, is gonna be 1200 megawatts. So in other words, enough gas has to be burned to produce 1200 megawatts of power. Okay, now that doesn't mean you actually get, tw wow, I can't even spell a W. That doesn't actually mean you get 1200 megawatts out, you only get 600 out because it's only 50% efficient. Okay, but we have to burn enough gas to produce that. Okay, so from here, we need to think, okay, so that's 1200 megajoules per second. All right, so 1200 megajoules per second. And if I'm asked about the specific energy, that basically means that I need the number of joules or megajoules per kilogram. Right, so what other information am I given? 
Well, I know that the mass that is burned per second is 20 kilograms. So in other words, the, this power plant is burning natural gas at a rate of 20 kilograms per second. All right, so that tells me, if you think in terms of unit conversions, if I have seconds on the bottom, I need seconds on the top. For every one second that passes, that requires 20 kilograms of natural gas to be burnt. Okay, seconds cancels, and I get 1,200 divided by 20, which is 60, and the unit for that is megajoules per kilogram, which is exactly what the unit for specific energy should be. Okay, so hopefully that's what you got. Pause there if you need to look at that some more. All right, and uh, let's see. These are just some more examples. All right, so let's move on in the unit. Um, in the last video, we talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so mostly we focus on the advantages of fossil fuels. Um, before we move on, I want you to kind of think, what are some disadvantages of fossil fuels that either we've talked about in the last video or that you just kind of know about? Okay, so pause there and try to answer that. Okay, so this is not a complete list, but these are some disadvantages to fossil fuels. Okay, so obviously fossil fuels are a non-renewable energy source. Um, they cause a lot of pollution, not just in terms of greenhouse gases, which we talked about greenhouse gases and um, the fact that fossil fuels, when you burn them, produce carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, but also a lot of other bad chemical stuff, right? They, they release um, chemicals into the air. They can cause toxic fumes, um, acid rain, because they, they can um, kind of decrease the uh, acidity of of uh, water in the air and that, that can produce what's called acid rain that can cause c contamination to vegetation. Um, it's also dangerous to extract because we talked about the dangers of, for example, like working in a coal mine or working on or, uh, an oil rig or stuff like that. Okay, And so those are just some of the disadvantages um, to using fossil fuels. Now, in the, throughout the world, of course, we um, people have decided in different countries that you know the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. That's kind of a decision that countries you know have to make on their own, um, because there are remember a lot of advantages to fossil fuels. They're really cheap. They're they're easy to find. They're abundant. They're easy to use, um, and a lot of in infrastructures already been invested to um, to easily use fossil fuels as an energy source. So there are a lot of energy sources. Uh, so, uh, there, sorry, there are a lot of advantages to uh, fossil fuels. Now let's kind of change um, change gears for a second and let's talk about the most common secondary source of energy which is electricity. Okay, so this is not something we spent a ton of time talking about um, in IB physics, but I want to talk just briefly about how do we produce electricity. Okay, we know we have all these different primary sources that we talked about in the last video, but how do we actually use those energy sources to produce electricity? And so I'm only going to briefly talk about this. This is um, a really interesting concept that's just, it's not heavily featured in IB physics. Um, normally you would learn about maybe in AP physics or um, you know college physics, but it's not in the IB curriculum. So we're not gonna spend a ton of time talking about it. Okay, but this is basically uh, the idea of what's called electromagnetic induction. Okay, electromagnetic induction. And I will try to link a video and a simulation uh, so that you can play around with it and kind of get, get an idea of how electromagnetic induction works. But the basic principle behind electromagnetic induction is this. Okay, it was discovered in the 1800s, uh, the concept of that you can create an electromagnet, right? If you run current through a wire, then that current can produce its own magnetic field. We talked about that, you know, in the magnetism unit, and then we, we also talked about like solenoids and stuff like that, same principle. If you run current through a wire, um, like through, through a loop of wire, it produces a magnetic field, All right? That's how we get electromagnets. Now, some guy named Faraday, back in the 1800s, kind of had the idea that, okay, so we can use electricity to make magnetism, can we do the opposite? Can we use magnetism to make electricity? 
And it turns out the answer to that question is, yes, we can use magnetism to make electricity. And so electromagnetic induction is what that's called. It's, it's using electromagnetism and inducing um, the creation of current. And so it's basically the opposite of um, creating an electromagnet. Rather than using electricity to make a magnet, you're using a magnet to make electricity. And the way that works is kind of difficult to explain, which is why it's not in the IB curriculum. But basically, the principle is if you have a loop of wire, this picture's not not too great. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to read what it says exactly, but I'm just going to kind of explain the gist. Um, basically, if you have a loop of wire, if you take a magnet um, and you hold it near the wire, there is a magnetic field. There's magnetic field lines going through the loop of wire. Okay, the magnetic field lines just going through the loop of wire, that doesn't do anything. What Faraday discovered was it's not the fact that there's a magnetic field going through the wire, but when you change that field, then it produces a current. And you can actually do this um, demonstration if you have an ammeter, you can take a, a loop of copper wire and a magnet and move it back and forth um, and you can actually see the ammeter go back and forth as it produces electricity and so it's not the magnetic field just by itself it is the changing magnetic field that produces current okay and so you need some way to get a, um, a magnetic field to change as it goes through a loop of wire and that's basically the idea of um, how we produce all of our electricity and so the idea is that when you think of power plants, power plants basically need um, need some way of making the turbines spin because inside the turbines you have really strong magnets and you have like you know giant loops of wire. And by getting the turbines to spin around, you you produce through electromagnetic induction you produce electricity. So the secret is how do you get the turbines to turn? Okay, so if you think like a windmill, a windmill, obviously the wind turns the turbines and that, that turns a magnet through, uh, so it, it turns a loop through the magnetic field and that produces electricity. Okay, so wind is really easy. Um, if you think like, um, like if you have like a paddle wheel by a river, as the river flows, it makes the wheel spin around. Okay, again, that's really easy. In the case of um, power plants, what we call thermal power stations, um, in a thermal power station, we use some type of primary source of energy. Um, we convert it into heat, and then we use that heat to um, to boil water. We turn the water into steam, and then the steam kind of pushes on the turbines, which have those, um, which are connected to those generators, which turn those loops of wire through the magnetic field, which produces electricity. Okay, and so. This electromagnetic induction thing, even though we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, is probably one of the most important discoveries, like literally in the history of the world. Um, ironically, it was it was around the same time as the American Civil War, um, and a famous physicist once once commented that you know in, in the grand scheme of of the history of the human race, the American Civil War, as as big of a deal as that was pales in comparison to the discovery of electromagnetic induction because that that was basically how we started getting electricity in, in homes and businesses and it completely like revolutionized the way the world works because then you have you know lights and you have telegraphs and um you know then you get radio towers and tv and now we have all, all this technology okay all because of electromagnetic induction anyway so thermal power station um, uses some type of primary source of energy to create heat, um, heats the water, creates steam, turns the turbines, which creates electricity. Okay, so in a fossil fuel plant or in a biomass plant, you're just basically using combustion. You're taking your piece of coal, you're throwing it in the furnace, and the furnace heats water and creates steam and you know turns the turbines. In a nuclear power plant, basically the exact same thing happens. Um, Except it doesn't. The energy doesn't come from combustion. It comes from actually nuclear fission, and we talked about nuclear fission um, earlier this year. Okay, but either way, it's the same basic principle. And this diagram here um, kind of like outlines how that works. And all of these things are, are things that that you need to be able to explain um, as part of this unit, which is why we're talking about it. But I would encourage you to refer to your textbooks uh, for more details, of course. Okay, so here you can kind of see um, you got water, you got some type of boiler, you produce steam, um, 
that pushes on the turbines and produces you know that that rotation of the the turbines turning those those loops of wire through that magnetic field you get a changing magnetic field and that creates electricity and then that goes to you know people and people's houses and businesses and stuff and so really the only difference between a nuclear power plant and a coal power plant i'm like you know simplifying but basically the only difference is where does the heat come from does it come from you know combustion or does it come from fission and it's more complicated than that but like from an energy production standpoint that's really the only difference all right so that is um, the general principle of how a thermal power station works as we go through the unit we will talk more in detail about how um, different power plants work more specifically but that's the general premise um, you would be expected on on test questions and worksheet questions to be able to kind of outline this process um, and understand like the different steps in the electricity production um, in a thermal power station so just kind of keep that in mind all right, so I think um, I think we're just briefly going to introduce the concept of energy degradation um, in this video. So the idea of energy degradation, um, you can read what it says on the slide, add it to your notes if you'd like. Okay, but basically the idea is that in any given process, any given like thermodynamic process, you always have some heat lost to the environment. Okay, that's what it says down here. Okay, so anytime you're doing anything, whether it's, you know, using a, a cook fire or working out, okay, when you're working out, you get the energy from eating food. And most of the energy goes to you working out, but some of it is produced, you know, into heat, okay, and sweat and stuff like that. And, and there's no way to avoid that. Um, and we're not going to talk, like, about all the laws of thermodynamics because I don't want to. Um, but basically what you need to know from the slide is this concept of energy degradation and so the idea is that in any mechanical process like i said you always have some amount of energy uh, that is converted to heat okay there's no way to avoid that it's a principle of physics it has to do with the laws of thermodynamics there's again no way to avoid it. it's not because we, you know we haven't invented a hundred percent efficient machine it's that it's physically impossible okay there's no way to do it it violates what's called the second law of thermodynamics Okay, so not only can you not have more than 100% efficiency, okay, but basically what this is saying is um, you can't even get to 100% efficiency in a real situation, okay, because you always have some amount of energy lost to the heat, and that's the idea of energy degradation, okay. Degradation means like degrading the energy, okay, Ma meaning the energy becomes a less useful form, it becomes lower, it's degraded, okay, by a less useful form, I mean heat okay because heat is considered like a waste of energy because it's not well n not always but it's usually not um not useful for the process you're trying to do okay so when we talk about energy degradation we're, we're talking about energy lost to heat um that we can't use for anything else all right so the idea of a sinky diagram and we'll, we'll probably stop it here because I, I want to do some more uh, calculation examples later. But just to really briefly touch on the idea of a Sinky diagram, a Sinky diagram is basically a fancy word for energy flow diagram. It is a diagram drawn with arrows, which shows how the how in any given like situation the energy changes throughout the system, and you always have different types of energy, and at each stage you always have some energy loss due to heat or due to friction or something like that. Okay, so here for example we have a um, we have a hot air balloon. Okay, and so the hot air balloon. Um, you know, gets its energy from, from the fuel tank, from that chemical energy. And so you start with all of this chemical energy in the hot air balloon's fuel. As you burn that, the balloon goes up. It goes up into the air, meaning some of that chemical energy is converted into potential energy. Okay, and, and we've talked about conservation of energy before. Um, and so we know, you know, we're not creating or destroying energy. But we also know that not all of the chemical energy actually becomes gravitational potential energy because we lose some due to heat. Okay, and that's indicated by the yellow arrow that you see down here. 
Typically, air is going down away from the main path, always represent energy lost due to heat. All right, as the balloon goes up, apparently it's attached to like a fan or something, and so some of that potential energy gets turned into kinetic energy, not all of it. Right, look at the width of the arrow, because when you're looking at a sinky diagram, the width of the arrow uh, is, is important, and we'll talk more about that in the next video. Um, but again, notice that each stage we are losing more and more energy, and so the overall energy, um, the overall useful energy at the end of the problem is represented by this purple arrow that's much smaller than the energy that we started with in the red arrow. Okay, and so in the next video, we will talk more about Sankey diagrams and how to draw and interpret Sankey diagrams. Again, the width is important, and, and we'll get into all of that. Um, typically, problems involving Sankey diagrams are not complicated at, at all, as long as you understand what it is you're looking at. Okay, but that's the basics behind what a Sankey diagram is. It's basically just an energy flow diagram that shows you know the different types of conversion of energy, but also the energy being lost at each stage. All right, so we're going to go ahead and stop this video here, and we'll talk more about Sankey diagrams in the next video. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you guys in the next video.